it was Einstein himself that settled the question of the ether by proposing this space-time that has curvature but isn't really an object in the conventional sense. And so how important do you think that was for the eventual formulation of quantum mechanics in the form that is commonly accepted today? Well, I think uh, you know clearly Heisenberg was deeply influenced by it. Heisenberg not only read Einstein and took Einstein's advocacy of observerless physics to heart, another influence that uh, he particularly called out was uh, Goethe and uh, what was called Naturphilosophie. If you read, uh, I think it's Physics and Philosophy that Heisenberg wrote, he specifically quoted a section from uh, Goethe's Faust, where Faust is lecturing his student about how reason is fettering the mind in Spanish boots, the, the infamous torture device of the Spanish Inquisition to crush the feet and extract a confession from someone being interrogated. The implication being that you shouldn't uh, put your mind in a straitjacket. You need to be open and, and uh, uh, be willing to embrace counterintuitive and contradictory uh, ideas. So between that and the Machian uh, positivism that was mediated through Einstein and special relativity, that was really at the heart of Heisenberg's development of quantum mechanics. And Bohr was very much on uh, the same page with his notions of, of complementarity. On the other side of the issue, there were physicists trying to come up with you know, understanding what mediation might be taking place. Uh, de Broglie was the, the pioneer of arguing that there were uh, waves associated with particles and that was through their interaction that you know that's what gave rise to quantum mechanics. Schrodinger took de Broglie's idea of matter waves and developed his uh, equations for it. But uh, ultimately, you know, Bohr won the argument for, for better or worse. You know, there is a uh, uh, you know, Murray Gell-Mann argued that Bohr brainwashed a generation of physicists into thinking that the Copenhagen School had answered all the fundamental questions about quantum mechanics, uh, including the view that there's no medium, quantum mechanics just happens, we have these observations, it's meaningless to talk about the underlying process or mediation that's that's taking place. And I think that that has... Uh, uh, that's been an issue that we've been wrestling with in physics ever since. Again, it's really funny too, because despite the fact that Bohr, you know, proclaim is proclaiming himself the winner of this debate. If you go back and listen to like the transcripts of the journalists who were there and Adam K did a great job of highlighting this in his book, you see that there's this, again, a, a very different emotional substructure to the interactions that are going around. Like it, it's described that, Bohr's kind of trotting along behind Einstein, like really desperate at all times to get Einstein's approval that he, he has, he's actually convinced him of his position and he's never able to get that affirmation from Einstein throughout it. And so despite the fact that Einstein wasn't mounting a sufficient argument to persuade his uh, detractors, I don't think that they were totally satisfied either because they had not convinced him. So it was like a little bit... Of a, of a Pyrrhic victory in some sense. Can we put Bohr's perspective in some kind of neat package for the sake uh, of consideration? So it's like you say that Bohr won the argument. Well, Bohr's argument was that you shouldn't try to seek the uh, you know, some uh, you know, non-contradictory -co coherent explanation of uh, how atomic physics works. He argued that uh, you know, great truths were essentially contradictory, that you could look at it from the perspective of a particle, or you could look at it from a perspective of a wave. It could not be both at the same time. Uh, yes, that's contradictory, but that's just the way the world is, and you can't uh, move beyond it. We have to focus instead just on the the observations that we get in a sense uh, observers are creating 
the reality through the act of their observation. So, you know, Schrodinger, for instance, came up with this famous cat example uh, of you know the cat in the box with the radioactive substance that has a 50-50 chance of breaking a vial of poison and killing the cat. Schrodinger came up with that to point out how crazy the idea is that the cat is both alive and dead until an observer opens the box and, and takes a look at it. But that really was the uh, the physical picture that Bohr and a lot of his followers uh, had of physical reality and how it works. In later versions of that, you had uh, everything from you know, consciousness being thought to be uh, required in order to make a measurement. You know, if if the tree falls in the forest and no one, you know, hears it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's in an indeterminate state between being upright and being on the ground until someone comes and observes it. Uh, just a lot of you know, very difficult to understand from our everyday common sense perspective views on how reality works at the quantum level. And this, and you mentioned positivism. Um, I just want to make sure nobody was lost in the dust with that one. This all sort of is reinforced by a positivist philosophy, from what I understand. Can you just really quickly tell people what positivism is? Because I don't want that to be lost. Now, the kind of a proto positivism or you know, one, one of the early foundations of it was from uh, Ernst Mach. You know, Mach numbers were named after him. He did a lot of work on mechanics. He wrote a very good history of mechanics book of uh, you know, describing the development of mechanics. But Mach's perspective was that physics should be just about observations, just about what we see and that we should not go beyond that. So, you know, to the end of his life, he never accepted atomic theory. He never accepted atoms as being real entities. You know, he would grudgingly admit it was a useful concept for uh, understanding chemical experiments, but it was just a, a mental label that we use to help label some of the observations that we get when we perform chemical experiments. And that, uh, you know, very strict recognition that physics focuses only on observations, of course, is what inspired Einstein to develop uh, special relativity. And it really became pervasive in the uh, quantum era. It was a, an acknowledgement that our senses are limited, that we cannot necessarily understand what's going on. And it basically uh, drew a sharp delineation between what we have perceived and what is out there in reality. And it argued that uh, we can never know what is out there in reality. All we can do is take our observations of our experiments, take our perceptions, and try to understand them. And that, you know, the, the question of why did that really happen was philosophically inadmissible. We can't entertain any mechanism, any process out there. We can only look at the results of the experiment, at the the perceptions we get when we which, take which, a look at reality. Which on its face is like, that's a fairly, I, I could see that as a conservative, careful way of gripping a phenomena, but it's interesting how it metastasizes to the point of uh, there is no reality until it's observed. And you see right. this being employed by like, all sorts of crazy situations today. Like everybody doing any kind of science now just defers to this kind of positivist quantum mechanics. 